pick. All right, before we jump into 15, I've got a couple things to catch your attention here, maybe. Uh, a reaction run by Moses Gomberg at the University of Michigan about 100 years ago. He took this triphenyl methyl bromide and he treated it with finely divided silver metal. And he got a strange product. He got a product that was C19H15, the mass spec 243. He didn't know what that structure was. He got a byproduct of silver bromide. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, 243, does it have nitrogen in it then? No. <laughs> There's no nitrogen here to begin with. And the bromide ends up on the silver. So what is this product? Well, he finally figured it out. And it looks like this. Remember, phenyl corresponds to benzene rings. And what's right here, if you pull off this bromine atom here, you just get this radical right here. <laughs> Trivalent carbon? Wait a minute, we've been telling you the whole time that carbon is tetravalent, four bonds, right? No, there is this form of carbon called a radical, free radical, which only has seven total electrons around it. And this is an unusual radical. This has with the three... Uh, the benzenes here it can, by resonance, delocalize this. We call this a persistent radical. It's still unstable. It'll eventually dimerize. But Moses was very uh, confused about this. Trivalent carbon it was the first time. We know a lot of different ways to make now radicals, carbon uh, with odd electrons, seven electrons. And that's what we'll be talking about in chapter uh, uh, 15 here. But uh, yeah, you can see uh, how that works there and, and add up the weights there for that uh, persistent triphenyl methyl radical of Moses Gomber. Another thing here to catch your attention a little bit. How about dental onlays? We've all had cavities filled, I think. <laughs> Maybe some of you have been very good brushing your teeth and haven't had any cavities. The rest of us have had to sit in the dental chair with the drill and everything, and finally they do the onlay with the polymer and the composite materials. Maybe you've asked the dentist about that, and a lot of you want to become dentists, so I think this is a good topic. What's this blue LED light, that gun they put in there? Once they get the onlay and everything ready to go, they always shine that blue LED light in there for a few seconds. What's that all about? Well, it's this camphor uh, ketone, which is the initiator for a radical reaction with this cyanoacrylate material here. This is a cyanide, an alkene, and an ester here. This is the monomer, which will become a polymer, okay? And so radical chemistry can make a lot of these polymers. You've probably heard of polystyrene, polyvinyl chloride, whatever. But the LED light excites the ketone to the excited state. We'll see it later. We'll draw the diradical, the initiator here, which adds to the alkene. And then it propagates. It puts together a bunch of the cyanoacrylates to make a polymer. So this chain can be hundreds or even thousands of units long becomes a solid material that intercalates into the little micro holes in the surface of the tooth and if you're getting a crown or whatever and that effectively uh, locks it in place <laughs> on your tooth making this polymer but the blue LED light is part of the initiation we'll see light activation as a means of, of making polymer so there's a couple things for you uh, to catch your attention let's go to the overhead here and go through uh, the topics and see what we need to know I'm uh, glad to report today that there's only four new reactions we need to learn. So for test four here, we've got the reactions, what, in chapter 12? I think there are eight of them. Remember those oxidation reduction reactions? And here there's four more. So there's 12 reactions you need to keep track of for, for test four. And we'll be clear about that. We'll talk about radicals and what they are, seven electrons. Yeah, the dot here, uh, they're neutral, whatever, and how stable they are, the different types there. And then we'll talk about alkane halogenation here. So we'll take alkanes, treat them with bromine or chlorine with heat or light and make the alkyl halide. Now we've formed halides before from alkenes, but now we're forming halides from alkanes. Alkanes are much more abundant from petroleum and other sources. They're cheaper than alkenes. So this means of making alkyl halides from alkanes becomes a very important industrial process. So I'll show you some of those, how they work. We will be limited to bromine 
and uh, chlorine. Fluorine is just too reactive, too explosive, and iodide is just too slow uh, normally. But with light, uh, activates, so here's H nu with light, you can do this at room temperature and just get monohalogenation to occur. If you use heat and excess uh, chlorine or bromine, you often get overhalogenation. And they're selective here. Chlorine uh, is somewhat selective for tertiary and secondary positions here. This is the relative rates of substitution at tertiary, secondary, primary position. But look at bromine here. Highly selective, a thousand times faster than primary and much times faster than secondary positions. So the relative rates here uh, for bromination at more substitute positions is much more pronounced. Bromine turns out to be more useful synthetically in a lot of ways. Chlorine's cheaper, and if you can separate them out, that's okay. And we'll look at the selectivity. So there's quite a bit to talk about here for this industrially important uh, reaction of halogenation of alkanes, anyway. And we'll, we'll relate it to synthesis. Once we have a halogenated alkane, uh, alkyl halide, whatever, we can do all the substitution or elimination reactions and then really uh, open up a lot of synthetic possibilities. So that's the thing. We got 12 reactions for test four that because of the versatility of forming an, uh, an alkyl halide, we open up a lot more synthetic possibilities. But we'll keep them just, you know, two or three steps of use the reactions and analyze things forward and backward direction. You should because stereochemistry, uh, the radical is a flat trigonal planar structure, so it loses the stereocenter at that point if there is one. Uh, generally, we get achiral or racemic products, okay, because of the planar radical thing. All right, a couple other things to talk about in radical chemistry. Ozone, we won't talk about that, O3. We used ozone to uh, cleave alkenes, remember, in Chapter 12. Uh, ozone is a, uh, uh, a radical uh, 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 degradation compound that will, that will uh, be dissipated in the presence of chlorofluorocarbons, which were used as refrigerants a lot of times. Um, these released into the atmosphere then degrade the ozone uh, layer in the upper atmosphere. If you want to read about that, you can um, in that decomposition process. I won't ask about that on the quiz or a test, so you can just read that and appreciate that anyway. Uh, the other reactions, I think there's three more. Allylic halogenation, if we have an alkene here with NBS and light or bromine at low concentration, we can get allylic bromination to occur. We've used NBS before for the bromohydrin reaction. Peroxide initiator uh, or light to initiate it. There's a couple variations of, of how we run these reactions. Uh, we can also um, talk about the properties of, uh, of radicals and how they're trapped uh, with oxygen. So that's maybe a tie in to some biological topics that maybe you've heard about. Uh, free radicals in the body causing damage, damaging uh, lipids or uh, genetic material, DNA. Um, and oxygen can actually initiate that. And there are certain traps in the body that shut that pathway down, which is vitamin E and vitamin C, actually. BHT is a food preservative to keep uh, polyunsaturated fats and food from going rancid. We'll kind of relate that, tie those two topics together just a little bit. So there's a, an interesting. The last two reactions involves anti-Markovnikov addition of HBr to alkenes in the presence of peroxide. So that initiates the radical process. Remember, we've used HBr before with alkenes to give the Markovnikov product, right? Giving the more substituted bromide. Now in the presence of peroxide, we get the less substituted bromide, okay? The so-called anti-Mark uh, product. We'll see how it works. It's really limited to bromine. Chlorine doesn't do it as well. Uh, well, wait a minute. That's just the carbon. <laughs> yeah. We'll just stay limited to bromine for this. Yeah, so HBr. Um, and then polymers. We just showed you the uh, dental application. There's many, many more here. Polyethylene, polybombing chloride, polypropylene, Teflon, which is polytetrafluoroethylene. There's many others. Polystyrene. We'll show you how in the presence of a radical initiator and alkene, there's no other reagents. We'll just zip together and make these long chain hydrocarbons. 
and whatever else is on the alkene kind of goes along for the ride. This is the simplest one. This is ethylene polymerized to make polyethylene, which you've probably heard about, but uh, we'll, we'll show you that, get into that a little bit. All right, let's go to the board here and see what we need to know. Go through the structure of radicals and some of the uh, characteristics of them just in general. And um, what we need to know here, so radicals are these uh, odd electron species. Count up the total electrons around the radical, what's that, seven electrons, okay? So this violates the octet rule. We call this an open shell species, so it's relatively unstable. We've talked about these before, right, carbocations, where we have six electrons and a plus charge. Notice radicals are neutral, right? <laughs> Count it up here. What's the formal charge on this carbon? How do you do the formal charge thing again? Valence electrons minus bonds. One, two, three bonds. Minus unpaired electrons. How many? Just one. <laughs> so yeah, the formal charge is zero. They're neutral. But they're very reactive because it's seven electrons. Okay. So these will be new intermediates that we'll look at. Moses Gomberg's triphenyl methyl radical is kind of unique in that those three phenyls highly stabilize that. And that's another thing we need to get into. But they're not carbocations, they're not carbanions. If we have two electrons there, it's negatively charged. So you can look at radicals as just a different intermediate, okay? Most reactions involve these kind of intermediates. The more rare reactions are these radical reactions, but they're important. There's a lot of important reactions here. And we'll see how the conditions are change to make it go via a radical pathway, okay? Um, usually these come from bond homolysis type processes, so we've talked about this. And what do we mean homolysis? Both intermediates wind up uh, with the same uh, species here. So if this bond breaks apart with one electron going to B, the one going to A here, just generalizing this, this is what homolysis, uh, homolysis. Lysis means to break. Homo means both things end up in the same state there. They're both uh, neutral radicals. Okay, what about stability here? We've got radicals. What types can we have? Well, we can have a uh, methyl radical. Okay, highly unstable, uh, just with the uh, three hydrogens on there. That's uh, not as stable as a primary radical, okay? <laughs> So if we draw it like this, I'm not designating the carbon, but if this is just on the end of a chain there, that would be a primary radical, okay? Uh, more stable is a secondary radical. And you see there, you've got two carbons on there. And don't forget about it, it has a hydrogen there too, okay? Secondary radicals uh, are more stable than primary. And tertiary, more stable than uh, secondary. So... What does this follow? This follows the same relative stability pattern we saw before with carbocations. So what do you think is the main factor driving this? Right, it's more carbons that you have around here, so it's an inductive effect of helping to stabilize that intermediate, okay? But what is the radical? What, what molecular orbital is that in? Right, it's in a p-atomic orbital. So we'll have to look at the structure of that and see what the geometry of that's going to be. It's trigonal planar, actually, okay, because it has three bonds to it. What about the P atomic orbital, though? It's half-filled, we say. Okay, It's not empty like a carbocation, but it does have a dearth or, or a lack of electron density, just having the one electron in it. Um, these are also similar in stability to allylic radicals. Uh, and what's the stability there? Or benzylic radicals. Okay, so if we can have a carbon next door to benzene, so that's similar to the Gomberg triphenyl uh, methyl radical. And what, why are these so stable? These are similar to the tertiary radical stability. And you might say, well, that looks like a primary position on the end. No, what other effect do we have here? Resonance, right? So in addition to the inductive effect, we also have the resonance stabilization. So can we draw a resonance contributor here? Yeah, so if we draw this, what do we get? We move the radical over to that position, okay? And that delocalization helps stabilize this, okay? Um, and we see this in the bond association energies also. If you take off of a primary position, 
uh, that's harder to do than taking it off of uh, a, uh, a tertiary position. So we'll see some of the reactions here. We'll have like a radical that will take off a hydrogen atom and leave behind the carbon radical. And we'll get into those types of reactions and radicals. But here's the relative stability. Uh, let's look at the structure a little more carefully. So here's our carbon. And if we've got, you know, some other groups on it, and then one electron there. Yes, it is trigonal planar. It's flat. Uh, so what's the hybridization of this carbon? We could say, yeah, it's sp2 hybridized. Okay. Uh, so this is a p atomic orbital that's just half filled there. And so we don't talk about the HOMO and the LUMO like we did in uh, heterolytic chemistry with cations and anions, nucleophiles, electrons. Here we actually have a new term called SOMO. <laughs> and uh, almost sounds like a sumo wrestler in, in Japan. No, it's not. It's different than that. <laughs> SOMO, what does that stand for? Uh, but HOMO was highest occupied molecular orbital. LUMO is lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. So SOMO is singularly occupied molecular orbital. So the single op occupation is the one, <laughs> one electron there for a SOMO. Um, there are some consequences to this. Uh, they are electron deficient, uh, similar to carbocations you could stay. And, and that's because, you know, it's half filled or is it half uh, empty? Well, it's more half empty, you'd say. So it's deficient in its electron density. So similar to a carbocation in that way. Um, but it is different here. Radicals do no rearrangements. And remember, rearrangements are very typical, especially with branching on what? Uh, carbocations to go to a more stable carbocarbon with one shift. Why no rearrangements with radicals? Well, let's look at this. So if we've got a primary SOMO here, and we've got some uh, branching next door. Why can't we do that shift? Because before we had the carbocation here, right? And if we had anything branching wise, we could do that shift very easily to go to the rearranged products, right? Why can't we do that now with, with radicals? <clears throat> well, here with the empty orbital, this is just two electrons moving over, right? To go to the more stable carbocation. So that's okay with an empty orbital here, right? Where we have a LUMO, lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. But here it's singly occupied. And if we were to move these electrons over, notice the double headed arrow. <laughs> If we were to do that, that would involve three electrons going into a single molecular orbital. And that's a violation of quantum mechanics. You cannot add more than two electrons spin paired to any given orbital. Okay. So this, this cannot occur. Um, and normally we don't see any rearrangements. It's really a hallmark of, of radical chemistry versus uh, cationic chemistry via cations. But anyway, no rearrangements, kind of a minor point. Uh, don't worry about that. It simplifies things, I think, in a lot of ways. Let's look at reactions in general for radicals. And the reaction types here, there's generally two types of reactions we're going to look at. And that involves uh, where you have some sort of radical. I uh, already kind of showed it. Uh, if you have some radical intermediate or reagent here with a singly occupied orbital, you can take this atom off and leave behind the electrons there. So, you know, we're kind of uh, combining uh, those, those electrons. And what we end up with is the radical on carbon here and what? Hx. Okay. So you see this radical combined with one electron here and then one electron in this bottom. Remember, each line's two electrons, okay? So one stays on carbon. This is called abstraction. And we'll see that in uh, alkane halogenation, of course. That's, that's a typical type of reaction uh, for radicals. Another one is additions to alkenes. So this is a little bit different. Here we've got our, our radical again. But instead of abstracting it out, you say on an alkene, it's already sp2 hybridized. 
uh, it's harder to take off these sp2 hybridized carbon hydrogen it's much easier to abstract these from sp3 so that's another thing abstraction from sp2 positions is a lot slower why that bond association energy is stronger and plus if you leave the radical on the side of an alkene it's perpendicular to the pi bond it's not resonance stabilized we'll see abstraction at the allylic position but right now i'm just pointing this out instead here you can have an addition to an alkene, which will look like this. You'll form a new carbon X bond and form a carbon radical there. Okay, so that's not an abstraction. This is an addition. Okay. Uh, there's one other type, and that's a termination, where you have two radicals coming together. Uh, in termination, we haven't talked about the mechanism yet of of halogenation. It's a way where two radicals can couple together, okay? And if that occurs, you see it goes back to the neutral thing and, uh, and, uh, and both radicals become, uh, become a closed shell. Both, both get the octet. This is far less common. Remember I said radicals are high energy species, intermediates. So to have two high energy species collide together is less common than an abstraction or an addition step. But anyway, those are the three uh, approaches there uh, for that. <clears throat> um, let's see, what else do we need to know in general? Oh, uh, oxygen can function as a radical uh, inhibitor. And oxygen is normally uh, something we try to keep out of a reaction involving radicals. So if you add a radical here uh, with oxygen, you see, you can have the uh, odd electrons come together here. And what do you get? You get the oxygen added on there <clears throat> and a, a radical here, okay? Uh, so this creates a peroxy radical type intermediate. Uh, and it's actually part of the, the damaging effect of, uh, of fat materials, and we'll see that later on. But here, uh, the oxygen is, is functioning as a, as a terminator for the carbon radical, and it's making an oxygen uh, radical. Uh, in biology, we'll see with vitamin E, uh, there's an important step here of terminating a radical here where you can abstract a hydrogen atom off of phenol. And what does that give you? It gives you the phenoxy radical, and it gives you uh, HX. So whatever that radical was, if you know, this gets oxidized in the body further to a quinone, um, but that can terminate, we say, vitamin E and vitamin C, we'll see later on, are means of terminating uh, radicals like that. All right, that'll become more clear when we look at some overheads and talk about that. But oxygen can uh, actually terminate radicals. It's detrimental to the reactions we're gonna see here in chapter 15. Uh, but it also slowly initiates the radical decomposition of fats <laughs> called auto oxidation. That's how fats go rancid. Uh, so there's, there's some important radical chemistry here in biology, especially if we talk about inhibition of free radicals in the body, which normally can cause damage, right? So, uh, phenols, keep, keep that in mind coming up. Let's look at alkane halogenation, our first reaction that we need to talk about here. So, halogenation of alkanes. And this is different. We saw a means of forming halides from alkenes before, right, in chapter nine. But now directly from alkanes. So this is important to talk about. So halogenation of alkanes, very different here. So let's talk about methane plus chlorine and heat or light, okay? Now heat, obviously, raising the temperature above room temperature. Uh, light lets you do it at room temperature, which is nice. And we'll see some advantages of light. H nu, that's what, Planck's constant times the frequency of the light. This can be white light. It doesn't have to be ultraviolet uh, light or high energy light. Uh, intense white light is fine to, to initiate radical chemistry. And what do we get here? We get uh, chloromethane. Okay, and our byproduct here is HCl. 
yeah, these reactions do become acidic. So that's where that hydrogen came off it. So what type of reaction is this? This is a, is it an elimination? Is it a uh, addition? What is this? No, well, this is substitution, right? <laughs> what are we substituting? A hydrogen is being taken off and chlorine is being added. Well, look, we have more hydrogens here. <laughs> So what else can form here? Well, methylene chloride or dichloromethane also forms, okay? Especially if we're using heat with this process, okay? Even if we try to limit the amount of chlorine in there, we'll often get what overhalogenation. In fact, that's not the end of the story. We also get what chloroform, which is trifluor trichloromethane, and we get carbon tet carbon tetrachloride, okay? So these are often byproducts, even if we try to limit the amount of chlorine. But if we use excess, we can drive it all the way to carbon tet, okay? Now these all have different boiling points, and I'll show you that in a minute. So it can be practical, whatever there. But if we use uh, light at room temperature instead of heat, and especially if we just use one equivalent here, we can often just get mono chlorination, which is very useful. And we'll see that applies for bromination also as well. So let's look at a couple other examples of this. Yeah, let's do bromination. And let's do uh, uh, with light at room temperature. And one equivalence implied there. So what do we get? We get bromocyclohexane, right? And that's great. We go from an alkane, we go to a bromine. And that opens up what? That's a leaving group, right? We can do a lot of other reactions from that. So synthetically, you can see how that's very useful there. And we're doing light and just showing one equivalent. So we just mean mono. If we showed excess here with heat, we'd begin to get di, tri, and eventually all 12 positions could be substituted with bromine. Okay. If we add excess and heat and let it go long enough. There's some kinetics here, right? If you limit the amount of time, you'll get more mono. Okay, so there are ways to adjust that. But this shows how versatile it is. How about this one? So propane, and let's do light, one equivalent. Ah, now we got two different positions, right? We have a secondary and a primary position. Cyclohexane, we just had secondary positions, right? But what about here? Well, we're going to get that. That's the secondary one. Uh, what other isomers can we possibly get? Well, how about at the primary spot over here? Yeah. How about over here? Well, that would be the same product, right? Okay. So you actually get a mix here of these stereoisomers. This is a way to keep track of isomers, by the way. How many possible monohalogenation isomers are there here for propane? It's just the two. Okay. So we'll get to some more complex examples here that show the uh, utility of this and the complexity of it. But let's look at another alkane here. How about this one? 2-methyl-butane, uh, right? And let's chlorinate that with light at room temperature. You don't always have to say the RT. If you just show light with uh, chlorine, you're going to get mono. And let's see, how many possible isomers can we get here? Well, we've got that tertiary one. Okay. And do we have a secondary position that's distinct? Yeah, we've got this one. We're going to get a, a bad mixture, actually, of okay, these. So let's see. And do we have some primary positions that we could get the chlorine on? Yep. How about uh, primary chlorination there? And let's see. These two methyls are the same, right, because of the symmetry. So we could draw chlorination here. And what? That would be the same as this guy, right? So those that's not a distinct isomer. Uh, that's the same. Is there another primary position? Oh, yeah. What about on this end here? Let's see. Chlorine there. Is that distinct from the other ones? Yeah. So we've got this primary one, this primary one, secondary, and that tertiary one. I think it's only four, okay? This is not a distinct one. It's the same as that one, okay? So the possibilities here for chlorination is actually going to give us a mixture of things, which is going to be uh, quite problematic there. Let's get into the mechanism now, and we'll revisit this selectivity issue. 
And the selectivity issue will come out of the discussion on the mechanism. So I think this is a nice thing. Let's look at this reaction, chlorine uh, with heat. Let's just say heat or light. It doesn't matter. One equivalent here. Yeah, if we if we let it run longer, you know, we'll get to get over halogenation. But, you know, how does this reaction work? Let's look at the elementary steps of the mechanism. Yeah, there are a few steps here. We have what's called the initiation step, which is homolysis of the chlorine chlorine bond. <laughs> we talked about bond dissociation energies way back in chapter six, I think. Yeah, that's going back there a ways. Um, can we break that bond homolytically? Yeah, because it is relatively weak. That bond energy is, is quite low. Uh, it's 58 kcals per mole, much lower than a carbon halogen bond or a carbon carbon bond, which are, you know, 90 or so. Let's homolize that. And in the presence of, of heat, we can do that. And, and how does that actually work? Well, <laughs> we're, we're exciting that, that bond length, right? So that bond, uh, stretch is going on, and we get to the point where I have enough energy where what? That just comes apart. Okay. <laughs> Into what? The two chlorine radicals. Okay. And notice they're seven electron species. They're going to be very reactive, keeping track of your Lewis dot. There's your, your uh, SOMO thing, the singly occupied thing, and it's two of them there. You can also look at this from the point of view of light, right? How does light work here for this? Well, we have the electrons in the sigma bond for that chlorine-chlorine bond, right? But we also have what? The sigma star, okay? So what does light do here? Light, a photon of energy, right? It's a little packet of energy. It is a small particle, a photon. It has infinitesimally small mass. It travels with a specific wavelength, and if that wavelength of light corresponds to this gap between the sigma and the sigma star, what can it do? It can promote an electron from the HOMO up into the LUMO orbital, right? And if we do that, what do we have? We have the sigma and the sigma star now populated. What does that do to this bond? It lets it move apart. Right? It decouples those two electrons in that bond. So electrically, maybe this depiction is a little more uh, rigorous uh, mechanistically, applying the principles of quantum mechanics and the molecular orbitals here. But, but I like this thing with heat, you know, getting that, that bond length to, to oscillate enough where it just comes apart. Anyway, that's the initiation step. Okay. Now let's look at the propagation steps. Propagation, there ought to be two steps here, okay? And in fact, this initiation step is often just catalytic. We just need a little bit of that to occur. And now the two propagation steps are going to take over, actually. So let's see what we need to do here. Propagation, we're going to take chlorine radical and abstract a hydrogen atom from the alkane, okay? So that one electron over here, that will combine with this electron in the bond and leave behind an electron, single, single hook uh, arrows, right? That means the movement of one electron. So what are we going to get? We're going to get ethyl radical plus what? HCl. Oh, good. There's one of our products, right? It is getting acidic here. Yeah, we should have drawn that up here, HCl. <laughs> okay. And that's where the H came from for the substitution here. HCl. Well, here we're generating a carbon radical, okay? That's not going to last very long. What else can that do? Well, that can bump into more chlorine, more molecular chlorine, right? And what do we get here? Well, we can abstract a chlorine atom from molecular chlorine. And what do we get here? We get the product. We get ethyl chloride plus what? Chlorine radical, okay? Notice we just formed the product, okay? Which is the key thing, we can say. And we formed what? The intermediate for the first propagation step. There it is again. So what? This propagates, we say. This just comes over here and grabs another hydrogen atom off that. 
we'll need to look at these energies and see why this works. This is actually a pretty stable bond, HCl. We'll see that there. And of course, carbon-hydrogen bonds are very stable, right? This is an unstable bond, this chlorine-chlorine bond. Okay, that's only 58 kcals. Uh, but then we make a stable carbon chloride bond and we regenerate the same intermediate here. We call this a radical chain mechanism. And by chain, we mean what? The propagation steps are linked together, just like links in a chain. They kind of pull each other along. And these will just go back and forth until you consume all the starting material and use up all the molecular chlorine. Notice we don't need to initiate anymore. That's the key thing. This just gets us started, this initiation step with the light or the heat. What propagates and forms a product is the chain, the two propagation steps, okay, to form the product and, and the, uh, the byproduct there. Now, this can terminate in different ways, and we do have a couple termination steps to talk about. Um, but if this is running fine, those two propagation steps will just go until it consumes and forms all the product. We, we can get a couple terminations to occur here. If two chlorine uh, radicals come together, it'll just reform the reagent, which is not degenerate to the reaction. Actually, that can be initiated again. The bad one is this, where two carbon radicals can come together and form butane. Now, sometimes trace amounts of these carbon carbon uh, radical coupling products are seen here, uh, but they're very rare. Why is this rare? In fact, these termination steps are both very rare. They're improbable compared to the, to the propagation step. Why is that? Well, it involves two radicals coming together. And if those are high energy, less stable intermediates, they're not formed in high amounts, okay? They're only formed in tiny amounts to get things started and to propagate things. It's much more likely that a radical or high energy thing will react with a closed shell species, an octet thing. Two open shell species, two unstable things coming together is less probable. And that's because the concentrations of these are very low, okay? There's the concentration, and there I mean very low, which makes their coupling together very improbable. Okay, I think we need to go to the overhead now, again, and, and look at a couple of the things there. Um, yeah, oh, here's uh, methane chlorination, which I'm showing here with some of those physical properties here. So in industry, this isn't a bad thing, actually. All of these products are useful. They can sell all of these, okay? <laughs> methane, natural gas, whatever, is very cheap. Chlorine, can shine a light on or heat it up for a while. Uh, if you do it short amount of time, you'll get more of these, uh, methyl chlorine. And you can separate those two, right, by their boiling point. So that's not a problem. But if we let it keep going here, we can replace uh, three or even all four hydrogens to make carbon tet there. That's the highest boiling point. So it doesn't really matter industrially. Do this on 10 scale and then just distill these all apart and you've got multiple products uh, to sell there. So that's often not a problem with the smaller alkanes. <clears throat> now here's, yeah, the mechanism with just a little more discussion and with the numbers here for the uh, bond association energies. And there I said, you know, the bond association or chlorine-chlorine bond, 242 kilojoules, uh, ouch, kilojoules, sorry. <laughs> Organic chemists, we use kcals per mole. That's 58 kcals per mole. So it's a relatively weak bond. And then uh, that's just initiation, right? That only happen, has to happen a little bit to get things started. So a tiny amount of the chlorine. The rest of the chlorine can be consumed during the propagation step, right? The second propagation step. So the first propagation is with the alkane, abstraction of the hydrogen atom, to give the ethyl radical and the byproduct, okay, HCl. And then here's our second propagation, abstracting the chlorine atom from chlorine with the uh, ethyl radical to make our product, okay? And notice here's chlorine radical being formed. That can go over here and participate in the first propagation step. And these two just keep going, right, until it consumes everything. You don't need to reinitiate things. It can occur if radical coupling occurs with the atomic chlorine radical and forms some of that, you can reinitiate it, but uh, generally, that termination step is not a problem there. But that's just a little more 
uh, things there. Oh, and this breaks it out a little more clearly, I think, the two propagation steps. And talking about the bond dissociation energies, and look at this, we're breaking this carbon-hydrogen bond. Uh, that's uh, 410 kilojoules, so that's a very stable bond. But look, we're forming an even more stable chlorine-hydrogen bond. That's minus 431. So actually, that first propagation step is indeed what? Exothermic. And both of these steps for chlorination radical chemistry are actually quite exothermic. And, and we'll see that has to do with the selectivity as well. And so the second propagation step is then halogenating the uh, ethyl radical, and we get the ethyl chloride product there. And so what, we're breaking the chlorine chloromo, and that's the weak one, 58 kcals per mole. And then we're getting a lot of energy out, right, exothermic-wise. So the ones we're forming are negative, right? The ones we're breaking are, are positive. This goes back to Chapter 6, I think, yeah. And so this step here is highly... Uh, exothermic. And so overall, we're, we're very exothermic. We're over 20 kcals per mole exothermic. So it's generating a lot of heat. And oftentimes you have to cool these reactions down or it'll generate too much heat and boil off your solvent or whatever. So these have to be controlled quite carefully. And plus for forming HCl, you have to neutralize that with base, whatever. And then often distill out the product, uh, ethyl chloride in this case. But yeah. Okay, let's get into this, the overall energies of the reaction. So if we look at this, our first step with the propagation step, and these are the only ones that are pertinent to the overall energy diagram, that, that initiation step, we don't need to worry about it because we're just starting out with that initiated here, right? Our first step here is exothermic to form the, uh, the radical here, and the last one's very exothermic, okay? So overall, we're going to a much more stable compound here. And it's not just we're breaking a carbon-hydrogen bond. You could say that's a more stable bond than a carbon-chlorine bond, but it's the reagents involved in the intermediates, right? We're forming HCl. So it's the total system that's overall negative in free energy. We can look at individual bonds and say, okay, that's not going to contribute to things, but it's the formation of the HCl and breaking the weak bond in chlorine that really contributes to this overall exothermic uh, process here. But the selectivity is something we need to get into now. Are we forming a primary radical intermediate or a secondary radical? Let's go back to the board and look at selectivity now and talk about some of the factors that might be involved in that. So what are we talking about here? Well, it's where we got this selectivity issue, right, that we looked at before. Let's look at some more examples of that and talk about the factors that might be involved. Now, you might be already thinking, well, that has to do with how stable the radical intermediate is going to be. Primary, less stable than secondary, less stable than tertiary. So substitution of the tertiary position should be, you know, highly favorable. And indeed they are. Let me give you some uh, numbers here. So monochlorination, room temperature, H nu, that stands for the light, the white light. And we're going to get uh, primary here, 28%. And distill these two apart. And secondary, those are the only two, 72% yield. So, you know, where did these come from? This came from the primary radical, right? Okay, and that's going to be less stable than the secondary radical. So your thinking's correct there. Secondary radical is going to be uh, more stable. And so, yeah, that contributes to more of the product, 72% there. Um, you know, and we can make a prediction here on this one. How about from uh, 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 propane? And that's even simpler, right? So we've got the primary one there plus the secondary one there. And you might think, well, we'll get a lot more of this, you know, uh, you know, three to one or whatever. But this one here is only 55%, and this is 45%. One of the things that begins to take over here is what you've got six primary uh, hydrogens, right? And you've got, got two uh, secondary hydrogens. Here you had six to four, okay? So you had more positions at the secondary, more stable thing. And then when you have less secondary spots, look, it drops down to about one to one. It's just not, not very selective. So, um, 
you can make some predictions there, but let me show you one that's even more complex, actually. And that's uh, with our old friend isooctane. Remember, we looked at this guy, the octane booster. <laughs> Highly branched here. It's got a lot of different positions to it. Let's look at this one, chlorination. And we're going to do monochlorination. And, you know, how many different sites are there and how many distinct isomeric uh, chlorides are there. So there's a couple ideas going on here. So let's see, uh, primary position, how about this chloride? And there is that terp butyl group, and all of these are the same, so that's just one. Uh, when this is formed here, it's actually 35% will be this one, <laughs> okay? Uh, let's see, how about that secondary position, which would be right here? That's a distinct chloride isomer from this one, right? And this one is 26%. Uh, okay, well, look, it's even less than the primary one. <laughs> the secondary one, 26%. Now, let's see, how about uh, we've got uh, a tertiary one, finally. We've got this one over here, okay? If we substitute right there instead, then, oh, it's, but it's only 17%. <laughs> There's only one tertiary hydrogen or here on the terp butyl. There's nine different hydrogens, right? So it's kind of weighted toward statistically how many hydrogens you have at that spot. Is there another isomer here? Yeah, what about this primary spot out on the end here? And I think that's it because these two are the same there. I think there's four possible ones, and this one's 22%. Hopefully that adds up to 100. I don't know. But let's see here. You can't really say that this one is the dominant one at tertiary or even the secondary one because they're actually minor compared to this one, which has more hydrogens on it. Ah, so we can look at the relative rates here. There's ways to figure this out. And it's just a kinetic effect uh, for chlorine going on here. Uh, primary uh, to secondary to tertiary it turns out to be one to uh, 3.8 to 5, okay? So that's actually not much of a preference for chlorination there, okay? Five times faster at a tertiary spot, so there should be a lot more of this. But look, there's nine hydrogens here, so that five to one preference, the rate of formation there, and a tertiary radical is more stable. But here with this terpene group, you have nine positions, probability-wise, that will form this guy. So that's 35% versus 17%. So that's with the weighted thing. So the bottom line here is chlorine is not too selective. And this practical issue here of forming a monohalide with a complex structure is just not very good. Okay, But let's compare this to bromide and see if we've got an advantage here with bromine. And see what we've got. Yeah, we've got a couple minutes. Okay, so let's compare chlorination to bromination now and, and see if we've got an advantage here. So let's pick an example here and compare chlorination. And what are we going to get? Tertiary uh, to primary. <laughs> And look at this, it's 63% primary, 37% uh, tertiary. <laughs> and there's your statistical thing. There's just a lot more uh, primary positions relative to the one tertiary position. But let's compare this with bromine. Okay, same thing, it's just having molecular bromine now with this substrate. Look what we get here. <clears throat> we'll get the bromide. And what about the primary one? If we measure <laughs> represented, it's 100%. Wow, <laughs> that's pretty dramatic, okay? <laughs> and that's uh, an effect where you'd say, well, it's all this tertiary uh, radical. That tertiary radical, right, is gonna be much more stable than the primary radical, okay? And where chlorine, you know, jumped on that spot to a great extent and wasn't very selective, bromine will settle for adding to that tertiary position. So what's the main factor here? Yes, it is radical stability, but it also has something to do with the nature of the bromine 
in, uh, in the chlorine here. So with bromine, let's do a couple more bromine examples. These are the really useful ones, I think. You'll see when you do synthesis problems, you do a lot of alkane bromination instead. So if you have this substrate here with bromine and light, look at this. You're just going to go right to the more substituted spot. Okay. The relative rates here for bromine, for primary to secondary, for tertiary, for bromine radical now is 1 to 82 to 1600. 40. <laughs> so it's a thousand times faster to react at the tertiary spot. So you just look for tertiary, and it's much faster than secondary, right? So here, your only product, and that's the only one you need to show for bromination, the most substituted one. And that can be obtained in 93% yield, isolated yield. The other isomers are not there in that purified amount. What about with butane, okay, with bromine? And light. Well, you're just going to get the secondary bromine. And that's the only one you need to show. It's highly selective for secondary over primary. Okay. And let's do one more. Okay. Let's, oh, yeah, back to, uh, iso octane. Same thing here. So what are we going to do? We're going to go right to that juicy tertiary spot. Okay. That's our only product we need to be concerned with. With chlorine, how many did we have? We had four products, right? And they're all kind of equal amounts, <laughs> really. But with bromine, it's highly selective for the most substitute thing. So let's see this. Let's go to the overheads. We've got a minute. Let's try to begin to understand this selectivity issue. So why is bromine so much more selective than chlorine for alkane halogenation? Well, if we look at these steps, for forming HBr now in this uh, first propagation step. HBr relative to uh, HCl, HCl is about 85 kcals per mole. HBr is only about 65, it's a lot less stable. So this is actually an endothermic step now for this first propagation step. And when it's endothermic, we're going to a higher level here, right? So if we add up these energies being endothermic, uh, the transition states here are going to resemble what? Not the starting materials, okay? The transition states are going to resemble in nature the thing they're closest to, which is the higher energy radicals now. Now, by Hammond's postulate, we've invoked that a couple times. <laughs> the nature of the transition state here resembles what it's closest to in energy on the diagram. So what's the closest to? Well, right, the intermediates here because it's endothermic. So this transition state leading to the primary is going to be less stable and higher in energy relative to this transition state leading to the more stable secondary radical. So under these conditions, most of the material will go over this lower barrier. Remember, molecules are lazy. They're not going to want to go over a higher barrier if they have a choice. They're going to wiggle and move around and have just enough energy to get over that point. Okay. So this becomes a faster reaction, one in blue here. Slower reaction is one of that because bromination is is uh, endothermic for that first propagation step. But notice we already talked about this for chlorination. This first propagation step is what exothermic. So these transition states are going to resemble what? Not these radicals. The transition states are closer in energy to the starting material, and there's really no difference there for those pathways. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, the one going to the to the primary one's a little bit higher in energy, but the secondary one you see is closer to it now, leading to the secondary. So there's less differentiation now with this being an exothermic step. Okay, so as this wiggles around, whatever it has enough energy to to really go over both just fine. Okay, so no selectivity here if that first propagation step is exothermic. It's Hammond's postulate, but you can kind of see it there, and it has to do with the stability of HBr being less stable than HCl being more stable. Okay, you get more energy release here. Here, you got to put energy into it, and that differentiates these two transition states more and leads to higher selectivity. But again, you know, don't sweat that. It's Hammond's postulate. This is allylic uh, halogenation. We'll get to that next time. So yeah, we'll leave it there. We just covered. Uh, halogenation right now. The bottom line is